Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you about L2 homology of groups. Um, so I have three lectures, and so the plan is that today I'm sort of going to do uh, mostly definitions and tell you sort of uh, mostly about homology of groups with interesting coefficients. Then tomorrow I'm just going to do some examples and computations. And then on Thursday, I'm just going to do some applications. So basically just a bunch of theorems that I think are cool. Let's get started. So, so really to start, I just want to talk about homology of groups. So let's start here. Okay, so uh, I'm assuming that you've all taken a, a course in algebraic topology, so you've all met um, at least simplicial homology and hopefully cellular homology. Right, so if I want to take the homology of a group, well, what I want to do is associate to a group some natural um, topological space which carries all the information of that group. And so the obvious way to do that is to pick a space with your group as its fundamental group. That isn't usually enough. There are many spaces with the same group as fundamental group. So uh, to start, we're going to have the definition of a classifying space. So definition, um, a classifying space. Oh, and I guess I should say that, uh, well, maybe there aren't that many topological groups people in the room, but all, all my groups are gonna be discrete and countable. Uh, and they're basically all gonna be finitely generated in about two seconds. So, um, so a classifying space for a group G. Uh, so this is usually called a, this is usually called a KG1, um, is a, so today I'm going to say simplicial complex X such that uh, pi one of X is my group. And uh, so sort of several equivalent conditions. So firstly, I could say that the universal cover of X is a uh, homotopy equivalent to a point, right? So the universal cover being contractible, but this is the same. So if you have a simplicial complex, then this is the same by Whitehead's theorem as saying that all of the uh, homotopy groups uh, vanish. I one of X for all I uh, greater than one, right? So the higher homotopy groups of a space are the same as that of the universal cover and contractibility is the same as vanishing of, of homotopy groups. So you can define this using homotopy groups and equivalently, and maybe what perhaps one would be most interested in today is that if you look at the homology of the universal cover with Z coefficients, this is zero for all I uh, greater than or equal to strictly greater than zero. Okay, so you can take uh, any of these, pick, pick your favorite one. Okay, so if you look at this space, this is uh, a space with the correct fundamental group. So now, conveniently that screen is off. So that was, that's better. That's, I'm not stunned by my own, uh, my own design. Okay, so um, the thing is that if you look at this space, this is some space attached to a group and uh, it takes a little bit of work. So uh, this is in Hatcher's algebraic topology, for instance, that uh, if you take two classifying spaces for a group G, then they're homotopy equivalent. So the homotopy type of this space only depends on your group G. And obviously the homotopy type does depend on your group G. If you take two non-isomorphic groups, you're gonna get non-homotopy equivalent classifying spaces. Okay, so examples. Um, so uh, it's the easiest example. So the easiest example is maybe um, a classifying space for the integers is just a copy of S1, uh, right? So this is, a, this is a space. This is the first space that you ever compute the fundamental group for, hopefully, um, right? The fundamental group is Z and you know the universal cover is R, so uh, the universal cover is contractible. Uh, let's say the fundamental group of a surface, uh, you get the surface. I guess I should say here, G, uh, at least one. Right, so you know that the universal cover of a, of a surface is homeomorphic to R2, right? It's either Euclidean space or the hyperbolic plane, um, and those spaces are contractible, right? So if you take the fundamental group of a surface, then that surface was actually a classifying space. Um, another, so a slightly weird one, is if you take a finite group, say, the cyclic group of order two. So it turns out that um, classifying spaces for finite groups are kind of bad, right? 
Um, so it turns out that they'll always be infinite dimensional. Um, I'm not going to go into why that's true, but for the cyclic group of order two, a classifying space is given by the infinite dimensional real projective plane. Right? This is some space. It has the same fundamental group as RP2. So that's Z mod 2Z. So that's good. Its universal cover is the infinite dimensional sphere. And um, I think this is also an exercise in Hatcher to prove that that thing's contractible. But you can actually, uh, it's, it's not hard. Uh, OK, so. Uh, this is some examples, and then some sort of general uh, theorems. So if you take the, if you want to get a classifying space for a product, this is, uh, you can take a product of the classifying spaces. So now you know how to get classifying spaces for free abelian groups. Um, and if you want to take a classifying space for a free product, you can take um, a wedge, a h one. Uh, right, this is probably all stuff that you've uh, you've met before. Um, okay, and I guess when I'm saying uh, equality, right? Really, I mean, you, you know, you can take these things. Right, this th this is a classifying space. Right, there are. There are many, there are uncountably many classifying spaces for a group, but they're all the same up to homotopy. Um, one nice fact is that if, so this is an exercise. Um, so if uh, my classifying space has one vertex, then, uh, then if I look at its universal cover, so this contractible space, and I look at its one skeleton, this is a Cayley graph uh, for G, right? So these things that you know and love, these Cayley graphs that encode the geometry of G, these classifying spaces, I mean, the one skeleton is somehow intimately related to a Cayley graph. Okay, so now I have some space that I can associate to my group. Um, so now I can take homology. I want to uh, pause for a second and add one extra condition. So the extra condition I want to add is that, um, so definition, so a group is of type uh, Fn if uh, G, if there exists a KG1 with a finite N skeleton. Okay, so I'm... Um, we're gonna want this later for technical reasons, and maybe in a second we'll see why we want this. This is some sort of finite generation assumption. Um, right, so that's true of, of these uh, three examples I've written down, right? So this has one zero cell and one one cell. Uh, I guess this is the point where I shouldn't have said simple issue. Oh, I dislike myself, okay. Um, let's say CW complex, sorry. Um, Right, uh, so this has one zero cell and one one cell, right? And no cells of higher dimensions. Uh, you can give this a CW structure with one zero cell, uh, two G one cells and one two cell, no cells higher than that. And you can give this a CW structure with one cell in every dimension. Okay, so these groups are type FN for all N. Okay, and uh, if you've never seen these properties before, the first, uh, you know, perhaps this is an exercise uh, but it's not one that I'm writing down as an exercise. So uh, F1 is the same as being finitely generated, right? So you can think if you have finitely many one cells, how do I get a generating set? I mean, how do I write down a generating set for pi one of a space, right? Well, somehow the number of one cells is coming into play there. So F1 is the same as finitely generated and F2 is the same as finitely presented. Okay, once again, just think about how do I get a presentation for the fundamental group of a CW complex? Right? So you can also think of these finiteness properties as some sort of generalization of finitely generated and finitely presented, which I think are all properties that we care about. Um, right. So also uh, G is F infinity if uh, G is uh, Fn 
for all n. Right, so a group is of type F infinity if you can find uh, classifying spaces with finite uh, n skeletor for all n. Okay, and, um, and so uh, what I'll say at this point is that I think every group you know and love is of type F infinity. So this property is, is maybe something you haven't come across before, um, but unless you're sitting there in the, I mean, if you've never come across this before, probably every group you could shout out at me is going to be a type F infinity. And if you have thought about this before, then probably you could shout out some groups which are going to slip me up. Um, so, uh, so, so don't, don't shout out groups at me. Um, but for instance, like groups, groups that are of type F infinity. So I, uh, I wrote down some examples. So abelian groups, uh, sorry, finitely generated abelian groups, hyperbolic groups, cat zero groups, uh, mapping class groups, out FN, uh, SLNZ, uh, uh, co-compact lattices in, in Lie groups in general. I mean, so a, a lot of groups, most of the groups that, uh, like three, three by cyclic groups, uh, a lot of the groups that are gonna be talked about in the next couple of weeks are gonna be F infinity, except for the ones that are specifically constructed not to be F infinity. Okay, so, um, Okay, so this is some property that, that I'm gonna care about and we're gonna use later for technical reasons. So I have this space, um, I have this property. So now with this space, this space is uniquely associated to a group. So a reasonable definition is to say, definition, uh, I take the homology of my group, maybe I'm gonna be very specific and write with Z coefficients here to be um, the nth homology of a classifying space. So this is a definition. Uh, the entomology for classifying space with that coefficients. Okay, so that's a perfectly uh, that's a perfectly feasible thing to do. And so maybe I just want to uh, add a little bit here. So uh, yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, I should have said that. Um, there's always a classifying space, right? So you can build one very naively. Um, just take a single vertex and then attach a uh, attach a single edge for each element of your group, right? So that is saying your whole group is a generating set, then attach uh, a two self for every possible trivial word or for every product G1 times G2 equals G3 for triples in your group. And then, okay, then look at this condition here. And so now you have the correct fundamental group, it's a short exercise. So now you want to make pi two zero. So just attach a three self to every map of the two sphere, right? So that's gonna have destroyed pi two, but now you've got pi three. So now attach a, a four ball to every map of the three sphere and repeat and take, an a, take a union. So classifying spaces always exist, but the way you construct them to exist is really nasty. You're never gonna get, like you, you wouldn't come up with this space or this space or this space. You always get some infinite thing, um, right? And that sort of has to be the case. Um, yeah, so thank you. That's, that's, a, yeah, that's an important point. Classifying spaces always exist. Um, here, when I'm taking this homology, so I want to be a little bit careful, and this is why I said simplicial um, or CW. So here, what I really want to do is take, uh, I really want to take cellular homology here, right? So I, I'm not going to dwell on, uh, on how you take cellular homology, but what I will just say is that, so what is this homology? You take um, the cellular chain groups of this KG1. So these are isomorphic to um, a direct sum of Zs uh, for N cells in X, right? And this, this forms a chain complex. I mean, so I think, I think more specifically, this is actually the Nth. I mean, I'm hoping you've all seen this. If you, if you haven't, then um, I'm sorry and... Uh, uh, I recommend Hatcher. It's my it's my go to. Um, although lo lots of people have told me I should stop doing that because uh, it's harder than I think. This is an M minus one. Yeah. So so these cellular chain groups are defined. Um, so the, the definition of the cellular chain group is you take some relative homology, right? But once you've done this, you can see that this is a direct sum of Zs, uh, one for each n cell in X, and you get chain maps between them. Uh, and that's how you define cellular homology. And so the point is that if, uh, so 
uh, f infinity implies that cn of x is isomorphic to some free abelian group m sub n right so the point the point about this finite generation assumption is that i write down this chain complex and all of the groups in this chain complex are finitely generated so hopefully you can actually work with them you can write down a basis you can figure out what these maps are you can compute uh you you can compute this maybe uh exercise com compute this in these examples i mean compute this yeah compute this for uh for s1 sg and rp infinity maybe also uh once uh, I think Kasha is going to tell you what a rag is. Is that true? What a right angled Artin group is. So once you find out what a right angled Artin group is, you'll probably be given a classifying space, compute the homology there. Right. So compute some examples. Go away and actually do this. Okay. So, uh, so this is sort of the topological picture. Now, you know, you you open the you open up this machine and you want to look at what's really happening. And somehow there's some extra algebra that's flying about that you've lost in this description, right? So G is a group. And so to a group, we can attach, uh, we can attach the group ring for any ring R. So let's just do this for, let's just do this for Z. So, well, okay. So, um, right, so this is what you do, but, so as I say, G, G has some extra algebraic structure, so you could have abelian groups with a G action, right? And then you could try and do this, but somehow, what are you going to put on this side? This, this space doesn't really, like, the, the G action is not apparent in this, in this side, maybe if the G action is apparent in this side. So what if, um, so maybe I should just say what's really happening. So what's really happening is that, um, Instead of looking at the downstairs sort of compact space, let's pass the universal cover. So pass to AG. Uh, so let, let, let me just say that uh, throughout X is a KG1. Okay, so I can stop writing KG1. Um, okay, so pass to uh, pass the universal cover of X. Okay, so this space is contractible and it has a G action. Right? So G, um, G acts on X. And if you think about what this, sorry, G acts on the universal cover, right? And the quotient, still the mod G, is exactly X, right? And it's a covering space action. So it's free um, and cell stabilizes are trivial, right? And so now, if instead of looking at these cellular chain complexes of this downstairs space, I look at um, I look at the cellular chain complex of the upstairs space, right? This is a perfectly reasonable thing I can do. I still get some um, I still get some chain complex. Uh, this space X tilde. Uh, is contractible. So this chain complex is actually relatively uninteresting. I mean, most of the homology groups are zero. Um, but what happens is I now have these abelian groups, right? Which once again are just a direct sum of, of cells, of n-dimensional cells in the universal cover. G is acting on those n-dimensional cells. So if I take an n-dimensional cell and I hit it with an element of G, it moves to some different n-dimensional cell, right? So G acts on this abelian group, okay? And so this action, so this turns, right? So this is an abelian group. It also uh, has an action of Z, it's a Z module. So this turns uh, CN of X tilde into a free uh, ZG module. Okay, so there's a little bit of, Homological algebra entering the picture now, um, which uh, if, your if, your, if your title has the word homology in it, you shouldn't necessarily be surprised the homological algebra is going to rear its, rear its head. Yeah, so free. Um, so maybe like I, for me today, I'm just going to be very naive and say that this just means um, it's a direct sum of copies of ZG. Um, right, so, but uh, 
yeah more generally i guess this this action should have some freeness um but uh so yeah that's a good question m3 if and only if uh, m is equal to the sum of copies of such uh <clears throat> Okay, so I, I turn this into some resolution of, of ZG modules or some um, some chain complex of ZG modules. Uh, and so an exercise, uh, okay, so and what are these ZG modules? Well, so as I say, a, a ZG module is free if and only if it's a direct sum. So what's happening here? Well, there's one copy of ZG, right? So each uh, each N cell, right? There are, there are G copies, sorry. Look at the orbits of n cells, right? For each orbit of n cells, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between things in that orbit and elements of G. And so what you actually obtain on the level of groups is, so this is a free abelian group on the n cells in X tilde, right? But as a ZG module, right? These cells break up into G orbits. And so the cellular, homology here is equal to a direct sum over G orbits of N cells uh, Z G. Right? Because right, for each, um, yeah, the point being for each G orbit, I get one copy of, of Z G, right? Because I look at the free abelian group on cells in that orbit and that's that's exactly ZG. Oh, is everyone happy with what ZG is? Does anyone want me to define? I've said it so many times. Okay. Yes. Yes, good. Okay, great. Um, so ZG, this is something you can define over any ring, is just the ring of, um, so this is just the set of formal sums, lambda G, G, such that these coefficients are integers, and uh, lambda g equals zero for all uh, but finitely many uh, many g, right? So it's just formal sums of um, it's sort of finite formal sums of of integer multiples of elements of your group, okay? And this has a natural addition, namely, if I add things, I just add pointwise. I just do do the naive thing, right? Um, and if I multiply, when I multiply two of these formal sums. Uh, I just multiply the elements of G. You should think about it as if you multiply polynomials in multiple variables. And so an example to think about is the group ring of, uh, apologies, the group ring of Z, I'm gonna put these brackets here to, <laughs> you know, I dislike myself, but that's, uh, it is just, it, this is just polynomials in, um, in variables, in two variables, t and t inverse, and t times t inverse is is equal to one. Okay, um, the uh, I don't know the group ring of uh, z mod two z is equal to you just take polynomials in one variable and you say that uh, if you uh, if you square that variable, mod out by the relation that t squared equals one. Okay. So, so here, the G orbit is nothing, nothing but the NCL being X. Sorry, the, so you, uh, the G orbits, are, ah, that was, I think that's maybe exactly my next point. Is, is, is this what you're asking? So this is the same as, so what are G orbits of N cells upstairs? Well, these are the same as um, N cells in X. Is that great? Yeah, yeah, so, um, Right, so when you mod out by the G action, uh, right, each orbit becomes one N cell of the quotient. So you could just look at N cells of the quotient and um, you take copies of ZG, one for each N cell. Uh, okay, so, um, oh, I'm going a lot slower than I thought. So maybe I need to uh, stop dilly dallying. Um, okay, so, uh, so I'm gonna look at this. Um, I, I get this new chain complex. And the thing is that because these are free ZG modules, I can now do homological algebra. So if um, M is a ZG uh, module, right? So this is, a, this is a ring. So I can look at modules over this ring, then um, define 
uh, the homology of G with coefficients in M as, uh, as the homology of this chain complex uh, tensored over the group ring with M. So here, I'm gonna, just gonna really, I'm gonna keep writing cell, just, I, um, you know, when you think about homology, maybe uh, you immediately slip into singular homology, at least I, you know, that's the most functorial, but really I, I wanna be careful and do cellular. I don't want infinite, the, the point is that this is some finite dimensional object if I do cellular. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is a way to define homology with some uh, arbitrary coefficients. And, and this is extremely useful um, I mean, so in some sense up to now, what I've said is just sort of general nonsense that is something you can, uh, you can do, but this is an extremely useful gadget. So um, I've given Sam some exercises about computing this. So uh, commute this for some interesting uh, modules. So for instance, so the obvious thing is that if, so if, uh, if Z is the ZG module, with action, uh, so the sum of lambda g g acting on t is just the sum of lambda g times t, right? So these these g's aren't really coming into the picture. I'm just it's just this z part. Then, um, then what's happening when I take this tensor product? Well, on this side I have a free z g module. On this side. I have this trivial module where G is sort of not doing anything. And so when I collapse this tensor product, oh, and I guess those of you who haven't seen this or have forgotten the point, one thing is that this, um, if I take the tensor product of a free module with some other module over ZG, I just get a bunch of copies of that module. Okay, so what's happening here, if I tensor with Z, I'm just getting a bunch of copies of Z, Right, and what's happening on the action? So you have to think about how what's happening with the with the action, um, right? But I'm actually just um, sort of destroying the G action and making it act trivially on one side. So then we obtain H N G coefficients Z. Uh, apologies for me writing so small. I'll I'll say what I wrote. Okay, so the um, if you just take the trivial this, okay, so this is known as the trivial module for ZG. If you take this module, then when you take this tensor product, you're sort of just destroying the G action on this direct sum of ZGs. And so then what you arrive at is the homology of the base. Okay, so in this one particular instance, right, this homology gives you exactly this homology group that I gave over here. But in general, you can obtain a lot of interesting things and there's a lot to be said. Um, you know, it's very interesting. Well, okay, there are lots of interesting examples. Maybe uh, Sam will give you a couple of exercises to try and, uh, Sam will give you one exercise that I gave Sam. Sam can do more. Um, okay, that, um, that are worthwhile computing. Okay, so, um, so that's sort of a prime on, on group homology. Uh, if I've lost you, try not to worry. Um, I just wanted to give this general overview of, of how you in general do group, group homology. Okay, so what are we interested in? So this is of course about L2 homology, right? So I wanna sort of do this story where what's my module gonna be? Um, my module M is going to be the uh, L2 of G. Oh, and I should, uh, yeah. The, this course is going to contain minimal analysis because my analysis is very shaky uh, at the best of times, right? So, um, yeah, min minimal analysis. But really, this story, um, th there's some deep analysis at the core here. So, definition. I mean, or maybe this is, maybe I could say that this is section two, uh, L2 homology. So, uh, Definition. So L2 of G is just the uh, abelian group 
So it looks very similar to ZG. I take formal sums of elements of G with some coefficients. Okay, but now instead of these coefficients being uh, integral and most of them being zero, what I'm going to want is that uh, they're complex, right? And uh, okay, it's L2, so I'm going to want them to be square summable. So the sum of lambda G squared is less than infinity. Okay, uh, I should have said this at the beginning. Um, please ask questions. <laughs> please stop me. Um, you know, at any point. Uh, okay, so um, so I have this space of square summable. Uh, sorry, I have this I have this collection of square summable sequences. This is an abelian group, right? I can add. Uh, if I add two of these sequences, then it still satisfies this condition. So, uh, so this is an abelian group, and it also has uh, it has a relatively obvious. Um, well, it has a relatively obvious action of this guy, right? So I can, uh, so L2 of G, L2 of G is a ZG module, uh, right? So what's the action? The action is if I take some sum, I should have used different, different Greek letters. Let's, uh, so let's call these mu. Okay, so the sum of uh, mu G, G, times some lambda g g. So this is, uh, this is my element of L2, and this is some element of zg, right? Well, only finitely many of these are non-zero, so I can just, um, why did I do it this way? Um, also, why did I use such horrible notation? Okay, sorry, let's just, let me let me just let's just say it like this. So, uh, if I take some group element H and I act on this, you can probably guess what you should do, right? I just put that group element inside. So this is the sum of lambda g H g, right? This is still an element of L two, right? Now, uh, okay, so that's how a single group element acts. So how does this whole group ring act? Just extend linearly, right? If I have two times h, then it's just two. I just put two here. Put the integer coefficient here, put the h here, and then extend over sums. And because I didn't write that formula down in my notes, I don't want to write it on the board because I'll, I'll screw that up. It's guaranteed. Okay, so this is an L2. Uh, this is a ZG module. So now we can define homology with this ZG module. Um, right, in the same way, we can just do this classifying space thing. We take a classifying space, we take the universal cover. I can tensor the chain complex with L2 of G and define homology. Okay, maybe you can this up for a second. So let, um, so I'm going to define the L2 chains of say X tilde. Really remember that X tilde is coming with this, this G action, right? And this is going to be, the uh, n chains of x tilde cellular tensor uh, L2 of G over uh, the integral group ring. Okay, um, right, and then this is a chain complex. So this um, forms a chain complex. Oh, I'm gonna give you another way to think about this chain complex in a minute. But as I'm saying this, I'm realizing that like, I, I sort of said that, I swept that under the rug here in quite a deep way. Okay, this is a homology group. All right, on this side, you have to convince yourself that this, um, this tensor product, right? There are maps from uh, the nth term here to the n minus first term here. Yeah, let me just stop, yeah. Worry about like left or right? Um, yes. So, do you want a left action here? I mean, uh, not a, like a change in free match, but like the even. Yeah. I think I think the place where I actually the thing I think the place where I've messed up is is here. No, this action should be on the right. 
right? So to take a tensor product, right? So so um, I'm extremely sloppy with left and right actions. Maybe don't. Uh, yeah, I hate Sorry that I did. No, 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 no. Somebody should ask this because this is important, and you do, you do have to think about this. Um, and I just uh, never do. Um, but the point is that that to right, to define the tensor product. I mean, so in general, when you're defining a tensor product, you firstly, the first time you meet it, you're defining it with commutative rings, right? And so then, left modules and right modules, it doesn't matter. Um, but the thing is that truly, to define a tensor product, you want to have a left. You want this to be a left module for this ring and this to be a right module for this ring, right? Okay, so really um, the definition I've given here turns L2 of G into a left ZG module. And really I want this chain complex to be a right ZG module. So really I want G to be acting on X tilde on the right, um, which might mess things up, but it's it's sort of a, you know, it's, it's a Cayley graph thing. So there's some choice about, right? In a Cayley graph, G acts on the, the left or right, depending whether you have edges from G to GS or G to SG. You have to like figure out some convention. So, okay, so I'm being very sloppy and, and really one should be a lot more careful than I'm being. And uh, if, you make, if you make all the correct choices then all the actions work out. So yeah, but yeah, there, there are choices to be made and I uh, perhaps haven't coherently made them. Basically, yeah. Could you give us a couple of examples of like, you know, what chains look like in that chain complex just to have a like that. Yeah. Um, in our heads. Yeah, yeah. Can I do that? Yeah, I, I will. I will do that in two seconds. I promise I will do that. I have. I'm supposed to finish five minutes before half past eight. Okay. Uh, I will do that in three minutes, and then I'll spend like a few, and then I'll, I'll spend quite a bit of time just trying to tell you how to think about this mess. Uh. Uh, but the um, right somehow you have to. This has to. When I'm defining this whole homology story, like one thing that I've really swept under the rug is that this um, doing this tensor product thing really gives you a chain complex, right? So you have to check what the maps are. Right? I didn't really tell you, um, right? I said, oh, you just take a tensor product and then you take the homology of this chain complex. But really, you have to know what the maps are. So just to um, say in this case, because I didn't say earlier, tensor L two. G, the map here is um, you look at the nth boundary map from here to here and you tensor that with the identity on L2 of G, L2 of G. Okay. So I, I sort of want to apologize at this point. This is a lot of homological algebra. And if you don't feel very algebraic, I actually sort of, part of me wanted it at the beginning. Maybe I have like two extra minutes, I've realized. So let me do this poll now. If somebody asked you if you were a topologist, a geometer, or an algebraist, <laughs> Raise your hand if you'd say topologist. Okay. Raise your hand if you'd say geometer. Okay. Raise your hand if you'd say algebraist. Yeah. You're an analyst? Yeah. Oh. We might have to stop. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So. Very few of you will call yourself uh, algebraist, and I think maybe for the algebraists, you know the story, and for the topologists and the geometers, this story is like you, you're sort of staring at me, being like you're talking this alien language, and I think that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, so what I want to say at this moment is, uh, don't worry, we're going to get back to the topology and geometry. The examples and computations are, are not going to use not going to use the algebra. I just wanted to set up the algebra because there's some story in the background that I wanted to tell you. Um, okay, so. Uh, so this forms a chain complex. So just before I, um, I get back to Dave's question, I just want to quickly define um, what the L2 homology um, is. So, so this forms a chain complex. So I can just take the homology groups for sort of marginally technical analytical reasons. So this, um, because uh, X tilde has finitely many uh, orbits of n cells. So this is where the property Fn is coming into play, and I really want to use it. Um, right, this uh, this thing here, Cn two of x, is uh, really you could think about this as a direct sum of copies of L two of g, one for each um, uh, n cells. 
one, one for each n cell of the quotient. Uh, and so once I've done this, this, uh, this inherits the, right, so here are the analysis words that scare me. This inherits the structure of a Hilbert space. And so, and these, uh, these, these chain maps become bounded operators. And so I don't quite want to define the homology as just kernel mod image. I really want to define the nth L2 homology of G as, um, so let me call this map boundary. So when I'm gonna be referring to, to L2 things, I'm just gonna put a brackets, superscript brackets two everywhere. Right. So the, the nth L2 homology of G is I look at the kernel of the uh, nth boundary map. And okay, you wanna do homology. So you want to mod out by the image of the n plus first. Now, as I say, there's some analysis going on in the background that I'm not necessarily telling you much about. So really you want this uh, quotient to be a Hilbert space. So this is a closed subspace of a Hilbert space. So it is a Hilbert space. So you want to take a closure here. So it's the kernel modulo the closure. Okay, so it's just a very little bit different. And the reason for doing that is that there's some, I mean, there's some technical reasons about dimension functions that don't work if you don't do this the theory. You know, the theory becomes a mess if you start quotienting by non-closed sets. Think back to your first course in topology. Uh, think about R mod Q. That's, so you, you don't want to think about that space. That's a bad space. Like, so you, you definitely want to, you definitely want to take some questions. Okay, um, wait, so, so this is what's happening. This is my definition. So, um, so just to say at this point, so next time, right, if you, if you're completely lost now, do not worry. Next time, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some specific examples and we're going to just compute. We're going to compute these groups for some, for some examples of groups here that you maybe care about. So how should you think about these L2 groups, right? Well, there's an important thing here. So I'm using, I'm going to use the, this finiteness property type Fn in two ways. So the first way, uh, the first way is technical and I'm not really telling you how I'm using it. And um, I, couldn't, I couldn't immediately figure out from reading the standard text on L2 homology, how you're using it. But it turns out that if you don't have type Fn, you shouldn't define it like this. You have to do a lot more work. Just like, don't do that. If your group isn't of type Fn, well, I wanna say that, that bad things have happened, but that's basically my whole career at this point. So, um, so think about that how you will. Um, right, so that's one way. The second way I'm using is that this is really, so what I should have said here is this is a, I'm looking at, uh, CN2 of X tilde, which is a direct sum of copies of L2 of G over N cells in X. There are finitely many of these, right? So this is a finite direct sum. So I could have just once again written that this is um, L2 of G uh, to the M sub N. And the thing is that so if you think about, right, so what do I want to say? So here, the, the elements of L2 of G are square summable sequences. If I take finitely many square summable sequences, right, then I can sort of club them together, right? And that will still be square summable, right? If you take, right, this is a, this is a fact about convergent sequences. I taught calculus one at least once. Genevieve can attest. Um, so there's some, uh, right, so if I take a bunch of square summable sequences, I can sort of club them together into one square summable sequence. And so really here, sort of the terms in each of these square summable sequences, I'm sort of assigning complex numbers to cells in a G orbit. And so you could really think about this as assigning complex numbers to just cells in X. Right? Because there are finitely many, right? And they're, okay, so there are finitely many G orbits. They're square summable on each G orbit. So actually they're square summable on the whole of X. So another way to think about this group, maybe this is how I'll think about this next time, is that this group is the same as 
the sum of lambda sigma 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 uh, n cells of x such that the sum, well, okay, so firstly, these things should be complex numbers and the sum, or these things should be square sum. Okay, so, right, and really what I'm using, so, so an important fact that I am using here is that there's only, that this is a finite, this is a finite direct sum, right? Because if I had an infinite direct sum, then I'd be requesting that I have square solvable chains on G orbits, but most of them are zero, right? So then I wouldn't be able to get this, right? If I had- Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Right. So here I'm, I'm really using, to make this isomorphism, I'm, I'm once again really using type Fn. I'm really using that this is a finite direct product, a finite direct sum. Um, okay, and so if it, if it was infinite, then bad things would happen and you wouldn't get this isomorphism. But now you have this isomorphism, um, this becomes much easier to think about. So you should think about, um, right, so uh, to answer your question, you should just think about assigning complex numbers to cells such that if you sum the squares of the modulus, they're less than infinity. So next time we're going to, next time we're really going to go through some careful, uh, careful examples. Um, right. So what I want to, so just to end with where we, so let me end with sort of, oh, Diane, I have a question. Diane has a question. Yeah. It's fine. I knew you didn't like complex numbers and I was like, Oh, um, yeah. So that, that that's a great question. So actually, it's a very reasonable question. So what if I just um, what if I just put the reals here? Right? So obviously, I, probably, I like I shouldn't just put the integers here. If I just put the integers here, then this condition is just finite, right? Finite. Like if you have a sum of integers which is square summable, then most of them are zero. Um, I want to put. Uh, I definitely want to put the reals or complex numbers here because I want to have some. Uh, I want to have some Hilbert spaces lurking around in the background. Um, now, great question. Why didn't I put the reals here? I don't have an answer for you, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, so I asked, so in the books, they just immediately go like, you just put the complex numbers, why not? And I was like, okay. Then I asked some people and it was sort of, I was told some things like maybe the Hilbert spaces, infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces are all isomorphic as Hilbert spaces. So it, it maybe doesn't matter. Sam, Sam, my TA. So just to make it harder for us. Just to make it harder for us. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, make it harder what, for you. What, I mean, I mean, I guess. So the point is that, that there's some extra layer of functional analysis going on behind all of this that I'm just not telling you. And that's why this is more complicated than it should be. We, we could just we can just do reels though while we're while we're watching you and it'll it'll all be the same. I think if you just do the reels while you're watching me, it should all be the same. And in fact, every chain I talk about is just going to be real numbers. So that that worries me. That worries me a lot. That that we want an answer. <laughs> so you should just put the reels here. But okay, so there, there are reasons, there are technical reasons why you might put C. Yeah, back. You said also at some point that you're putting a complex number on each n cell max. Yeah. Are you not putting an element of L2G on each n cell? No, in X tilde, sorry. I'm putting an element of L, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm putting an element of L2 of G on each n cell of X. And then in, in the universal cover, I'm, you could just think about this as putting a complex number on each n cell in the universal cover. Yeah, sorry. So there's a little bit of, uh, so really, I just I really just want you to think in the universal cover. So I just want you to think of these L2 chains as to every n cell of the universal cover, I put some complex number, right? And then how do you take the, um, so let me, uh, let me just recap, let me spend two minutes giving you the setup that we're going to go from next time. So I want to look at some space X tilde, right? Um, Next time, I'm sort of going to forget the G action, actually. So let's just, just put that to one side for a second. So I'm going to look at this space, which is the um, space of formal sums, lambda, sigma, sigma. Sigma is an n cell of x 
tilde, these things are complex. Sorry, Danny. Uh, these things are square summable. Uh, okay. Less than less than infinity. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Don't write vacuous conditions. Um, these things are square summable, and um, there's a chain map. So if I want to define this chain map from one to the next, um, see n minus one of two of x is defined by extending the um, right. So how do you want to define the chain map from here to here? Well, um, by extending the let's just say it like this by extending the boundary map um, in cellular homology linearly, right? So you should know, uh, right? So I want to. So I have this setup. So my setup for next time, right? And this is where we're going to start. So to say, if I've lost you with all the algebra, try not to worry. We're going to just skip right back to topology. So I have these space of uh, square summable chains of n cells, right? And I want to define a boundary map between them. So the cellular boundary map tells me exactly what to do if I'm given, if, you, if I just give you one n cell. If I just say like, here, here's this n simplex sitting inside your space. How do I take the boundary of it? Well, it's the uh, sine sum of the faces, right? You, you know how to do that, um, right? So now I know what to do to this sigma. I know what to do to these complex numbers. Just gonna send them across, just gonna extend linearly. And then I'm going to extend to, um, to square summable chains. Okay, so somehow, um, right? There's a group action lying around. So really this is, um, it, importantly, there's, um, Importantly, there is some group, um, but maybe immediately here you don't see it. So next time we're going to start from this formulation and we're going to do some computations in um, some groups and actually compute some L2 homology groups. All right, so I will stop there. Thank you so much. One more quick question. Yeah, can you give us a preview example? Because we totally dug Dave's question. I did totally dug Dave's question. So um, preview example. Um, so, uh, let's take, uh, let's take the tree, right? This is the universal cover of the rows on two petals. Uh, and so here's an L2 chain we're going to look at next time. So put one on say these two edges and then put a half on these four edges, a half, and then put a quarter on these four edges on these, uh, 16 edges, whatever. Right. So start at the identity, put one on the A edge and the B edge. And then at the next endpoints, put a half on the A edge and the B edge. And then put, and then at the future endpoints, put a quarter and then an eighth and then a sixteenth. This is a square summable. Uh, this is a square summable sequence. Okay, so in general, I mean, square summable sequences are relatively easy to come by. One thing you could just do is take finitely supported things. Um, what we'll see next time is, um, it will compute the boundary of this. So it turns out that this is this is a non-trivial uh, element of the first L2 homology of this space. So so maybe that's an example, but um, we'll see many more examples. And maybe like the examples you should maybe have in mind are the, the locally finite chains. So these are just the, the cellular chains. Yeah.